So um, welcome, thank you for coming. I'm Jen Stringer, Associate CIO for Academic Engagement uh, at UC Berkeley. And uh, basically what I do is the academic technology for the campus, so. Um, I am here on behalf of a bunch of people who have spent an awful lot of time thinking about what I think is a um, difficult and complex problem that is just starting to be addressed in a broad way uh, in higher education. Um, and so this is not my work necessarily, I've been part of it, but I want to acknowledge the amazing people um, who were on the working group um, which was an IMS Global Working Group. <coughs> How many of you know what IMS Global is? So, it's a st so for those of you who don't, it's a standards organization. It's a not-for-profit standards organization that works um, to create interoperability standards for learning tools. Um, and they also have done a lot of work around um, the student record and transferability of the student record data and that kind of thing. So they really think about how to get systems to plug and play. And if you've ever heard of something called LTI, which is the Learning Tools Interoperability Standard, that is a standard out of IMS. Um, and it allows you to plug lots of different kinds of tools into your learning management system. And um, they've started to think deeply about uh, learning data and how to exchange learning data in a format so that what you get out of one discussion forum um, is in a standard format from another discussion forum that's so that you can use it for research and for um, other purposes. So, and we'll talk about that. Um, but IMS has done a lot of work around thinking about um, learning data principles around privacy and appropriate use. And then the University of California, um, as a system, actually has a, a statement around um, student data privacy principles. And so my group, um, which is a bunch of educational technology leaders from across the campus, started thinking about how do we take that sort of statement of principles that the UC has already put out and how do we actually make it um, accessible and meaningful around learning data? And so we use that as our scaffolding as we were creating um, our own principles around learning data. Okay, it's not clicking. And I don't know why. Let me try this, okay. I needed to get in the right thing. So what I wanted to do is set the context um, for why um, principles around learning data is important. I'll actually do some defining of learning data and analytics for you. Um, and then I want to present the principles, both the IMS principles and the UC principles, and point out some differences. And also um, point out some areas, I think, where I'd really love to hear your voices in terms of, uh, I don't want to call them areas of disagreement, I think they're just areas um, across a spectrum of a variety <coughs> of issues that we're trying to bring to the forefront. So I'm really interested in your thoughts and um, opinions about this, specifically around a couple of principles having to do with ownership and efficacy, and I'll talk through those. So I want to give a nod out to the fact that um, probably within, I would say, really the past two years, a lot of work has started to be done around this area. And so um, I wanted to um, point out that there was a, a Silomar Convention for Learning Research in Higher Education a few years ago uh, that really started to look at these issues of um, the, what was appropriate, what kind of data do you need to do research around learning science? And, um, and how are we going to get that data and what are we going to do with it? Uh, and it turned into another conference that just happened about a year ago that was actually student data and records in the digital era. And out of that came a website and some resources called Responsible Use of Student Data in Higher Education. So again, I'm just pointing these um, out to you to say that a lot of people have been doing a lot of research um, and talking and discussing about these areas, are, these issues already. And then, of course, um, the Learning Analytics Community Exchange is actually an um, EU thing. And so as we've got, you know, the um, 
Open University and a lot of universities that are, uh, they've been thinking a lot about um, uh, online learning and the kind of data that is associated with it and what's appropriate and what's not. And so they've come up with their own framework that they call the delicate framework and it stands for a bunch of different issues that you should be thinking about when you're thinking about um, use of learning data in a variety of both research and what I'm going to call student success applications. So I use the term learning data, but oftentimes what you'll hear is the term learning analytics. Um, and what I would say is you can't have learning analytics without learning data. And so analytics is the process of analyzing the data and learning data is the stuff, right? Um, a definition of learning analytics really <coughs> didn't start coming about until 2011 or so when the uh, Society for Learning Analytics and Research actually held its first annual um, symposium. And that was LAK 2011. And you can see here that um, sort of two definitions of learning analytics were bandied about. And I'm going to read them um, because I think it's just important to think about them in the two different contexts. So one is the selection, capture, and processing of data that will be helpful for students and instructors at the course or individual level. So this is talking about the data um, that is generated that will help students and uh, learners and instructors. The other piece is much more around um, under learning science. So learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing the learning um, learning and the environments in which it occurs. So this is really much more about the research end of things. And so both are important because learning data is used in both ways. And learning data or learning analytics, as in the, analy um, the analysis of that data, <laughs> is used for those two distinct purposes. And what's interesting is as you get into um, principles around privacy, and disclosure and a lot of other inf um, those kinds of issues, you might come at them from different ways depending on if you're a learning science researcher or if you're actually a, an instructor or a student in a course. So I want to put the data in context because I think a lot of us are um, hearing a lot of information about metrics-based decision making at our institutions and now we all have institutional data warehouses. How many of you have institutional data warehouses at your institution, right? So, um, so in context, you've got institutional data that's usually in some sort of enterprise data warehouse um, and this is, this is my interpretation of the way I think about it, and it's not perfect, I will say, um, but I think it shows the interplay. Uh, usually it's aggregate, oftentimes it's de-identified, usually it's a dump and they're providing analysis you know, on a quarterly basis, or it's certainly not real time. Um, and it's looking at things like graduation rates and yields and a lot of stuff around money, usually. Um, and sometimes things around uh, Course, course enrollment, that kind of information is sitting in there. And then you've got the academic data, and that's usually in your student information system, and it's usually what you think of as the academic record, right? It's um, personally identifiable, it's usually the stuff that's on a transcript, but not everything that's on, I mean there's more than just what's on a transcript, like whether a student was on probation or not, which might not get into the transcript, whether they were identified coming in at risk, um, <coughs> it may have some socioeconomic information about that student, uh, their SAT scores, and then of course all the enrollments in their courses and that kind of thing. Um, and in general, it's sitting in CIS, CIS um, applications, student information systems applications, and sometimes advising applications that may or may not be connected to the student information system. And then you've got what we're calling learning data. And what that is is personally identifiable user activity. And what do I mean by that? I, I, it's really like the log file activity. It's the interaction activity of a student <coughs> sorry, a student and a faculty member with usually some system of record, like a learning management system, um, maybe it's a clicker, uh, it also might be 
um, a tool that a faculty member has decided to use that um, the institution hasn't licensed. Um, but it is data about how students and faculty interact with um, the learning system and the learning content. And like I said, in general, it's stuff that you might think of as information that you would pull from a log file. A student answered this question. Uh, you know, a student got this result on an automatic quiz score. A student <coughs> responded to a writing prompt. Um, this student looked at this piece of information for this amount of time. Okay? Um, and there's a, new, there's a new game in town. There's a new thing that's storing this data, and it's called a learning record store. Um, and there are some that are actually available out on the market right now. In general, those are used for a lot of professional education kinds of spaces. They're very expensive. Um, and then there are some open source learning record stores as well. So um, I don't think anybody's found the quintessential learning record store, uh, but they are starting to pop up. And they are different than an enterprise data wa warehouse, and they're different than the information that's in a student information system. And I would actually say that a lot of times it's semi-structured data rather than fully structured data. And feel free to stop me or ask me questions at any time. Um, at the other thing that I should say is this is a definition of learning data that refers to the data generated by students you know, interacting with documents in the teaching and learning experience and academic achievement. And I don't know that I actually really love that definition, but it is a definition that's right now sitting on those draft IMS principles. And so we'd love feedback on that too. So why do we even care about this stuff? Um, you know, it's been around since, since, in, since people have been interacting with online systems. It's not just about online education. Um, it's also about all the systems that faculty and students interact with on a regular basis. Um, but we care about it because this data in the era of big data actually enables institutions to make some pretty interesting decisions. Um, if, you, if you look at it over time, and I'll show you some um, dashboards. It can impact student outcomes. Um, are any of your campuses involved in any of the student success? And I use that in quotes, um, not necessarily derisively, but just you know, student success is all the big rage right now, and um, we want to increase retention and increase four-year graduation rates, and so we're spending a heck of a lot of money on um, consulting firms and on, um, and on services provided to us by vendors, reputable vendors, I, you know, but um, around student success. And so uh, do, are any of you, do you know if you're involved EAB student success, Civitas is another uh, vendor. Um, do, what vendor, do you know what you? It's I, the one from the advisory board company. Yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know what it's called. Yep, I yep. Went to a Yep. So um, lots of different ones out there. Um, we also care because if we give students information about their own behavior, it can actually impact um, the outcomes of in a course, for example. Uh, it enables faculty to support students um, and make changes to their courses based on data. And um, also it supports educational research and improved pedagogy, if used in the right way. So I just want to give you some examples of these things that I'm talking about. So this is a dashboard from Mentelify. Um, and what you can actually see here, it's hard to see, but basically this is giving you information about um, student uh, aggregate data and whether or not they're taking the quizzes and what the scores are. So it's giving faculty members a dashboard about their course. A lot of times these are built into learning management systems, but not to this kind of level. And oftentimes what they don't have is um, the, the mixed in data, like information about the student's major and that kind of thing that these um, dashboards are pulling from both the learning management system, the student information system, so they more, know more about the student, and then they're presenting sort of aggregate information back to a faculty member or even a program director. Mm -hmm. This is an example, um, this company actually got bought, but uh, Blue Canary was around for a while. This is a dashboard that a faculty <coughs> member might see um, that is um, bringing to their attention students at risk 
And um, this again is where we get into some of the issues that we're going to be talking about later and that I want your feedback on. But you know, these are algorithms that are being created on particular indicators to give a student a red card or a you know, yellow card or a green card. Um, and it's based on a bunch of triggers including you know, time spent in the learning management system, what their grades are, maybe even what their grades are elsewhere, um, what their general performance has been, what courses they've taken, and all together, it's giving the faculty member an actual um, sort of, you know, picture of what this, what Blue Canary thinks the student is, how the student is doing in their course. And I've had some faculty members look at this and say, oh my gosh, that's the best thing ever. And I've had some faculty members go, whoa, wait a minute, I am not sure that I'm, how do I know to trust this thing, et cetera, et cetera. Or do I even want to know what, you know, I know my students better than any um, tool is, is often a response. Um, and, and we can get into some of the things around what um, Mitchell Stevens from Stanford calls open futures, which is ensuring that students actually have the ability, that you're not closing doors to students because of algorithms or because of some red card, um, you know, that you're not counseling a student out of a course, for example, um, or counseling them into a different major. <coughs> This is an example of a student alert. So again, you could set alerts that say if the student hasn't logged into a learning management system in you know, five days and they've got two late assignments, I want to know about it and I want to be able to send the student a notification. Or I'm an advisor and I want to know about it and I want to send the student a notification. But this is an example of one of those. So you can see that the reason is the student has excessive absences and is not completing the class reading assignments or homework. Um, this is an e example that is a slightly different example. This is called um, the engagement index. It's actually something that we built at UC Berkeley that is using student engagement data to gamify an online course. And, um, and students actually get um, points based on their interaction with other students' content and commenting and liking. Um, and then they actually get, and some faculty members actually choose to base the percentage of the student's grade based on the, ex and the engagement index. So this is another example of using learning data or engagement data, not necessarily um, in sort of the um, analytics, how is the student doing in the course, are they going to get a bad grade, but actually is an integral part of the course pedagogic design. So, what is another reason why we care? Holy crap. Um, I, like, we're collecting a ton of data about our students. And yes, the faculty always say, oh, and about me. Yes, and about faculty and instructors as well. And um, you know, the what is this clickstream log file data, a lot of information about what you do. User experience designers love this stuff because it's how you improve your product, right? Um, but it's also now being used in learning science and in some places predicting student outcomes. Um, and who's collecting it? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's not just the institution. We're collecting it. We're collecting it as an institution. Libraries are collecting it in terms of you know, articles and, and journals that students might be looking at. Um, publishers are collecting it. Third party vendors are collecting it. And um, this, is, this is something that is starting as, as the idea of the next generation digital learning environment. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That N-G-D-L-E is a notion that's been put out by Educause um, about two and a half, maybe three years ago, which really has to do with the <coughs> end of the learning management system and the ability to plug and play all different kinds of tools to create a much better engaging environment. Um, and it's wonderful. And it also means that there are an awful lot of um, players in the market that we're not, we don't have contracts with. Um, that are collecting a lot of data about our students. 
Um, and it's also Facebook. If faculty members are asking their students to Facebook, it's Twitter if they're asking their students to tweet, right? All of that is really interesting information about how students are engaging in the academic environment. Here are just some of the you know, examples of what I would call um, you know, third party vendors out there that aren't a learning management system, but definitely are in the market space and are collecting a lot of data about our students and faculty. Um, Piazza is an online discussion board tool that's very popular in a number of places. <coughs> Gradescope is um, a, an actual automated grading tool um, that started at Berkeley but is now um, on the market as well. Um, and you can see Course Hero. Has anybody heard of Course Hero? Course Hero is a tool that enables students to sell their notes um, and faculty syllabi. Um, on, online, yes, make a face, because my faculty make a face all the time when they find out that their students are posting their stuff there. Um, but uh, VoiceThread is another one that allows you to engage with media and enables students to comment on media. Um, so all of these tools really have wonderful purposes, and um, clearly they're doing well, and so they must be serving a need. Uh, but they are collecting a lot of information about student and faculty behavior. So in the old days, way back when, when we were hosting things on-prem, um, and we were actually, even if we were licensing tools, um, we were running them in our own data centers. We had access um, to all of those local logs where a lot of that information was sitting. And so, you know, I don't know if you remember, but I remember the days of discussing with my systems administrator how detailed a logging we wanted to do on our learning management system that we were running locally on premises um, because it took up a lot of space, those log files did, and we flushed them occasionally. But that data was actually really important, and we actually were doing some research around how students were using tools. Um, but we had access to those log files, right? Because <coughs> it was on premises and we could just go do a grep if we wanted to. Um, we did a lot of ad hoc reporting, um, mainly for systems issues, but sometimes to answer a question like, how many courses are using X tool? Um, I remember asking that, you know, and, and getting reports on that pretty regularly. Um, but now as we're moving to software as a service tools, like um, Canvas or like Desire to Learn or you know name them or even when it's hosted off premises like if you're ho getting Blackboard hosted somewhere you don't have access to those logs anymore and vendors still use those logs to improve the system but I will bet you that in your contract it may not say that you actually have the right to ask for those logs um, or set out any sort of a, a um, relationship around uh, you and the institution and that data and what your right is to it. Um, so, you know, if we have contracts, they're not always specific about the ownership or access to this data. And if you don't have a contract, like with Piazza, for example, where it's faculty members who are actually signing the click-through agreement on behalf of the institution, although they don't know that they're signing it on behalf of the institution, um, you don't have any sort of right at all, right? <laughs> um, and so let's just say even if we have ownership let's say you write the best contract in the world and it says you know you have you institution have ownership over this data and and you know yes the um, vendor has the right to use it to improve their product uh, but you know they will either give it to you or flush it or whatever um, you still need access to it right so ownership and access are different and we can argue who should own things till the cows come home, but if um, you own it and you don't have some sort of reasonable access to it, it really doesn't matter. And so um, when you're thinking about access for learning data, it really is, it comes down to a number of things. One is this timeliness. So some institutions are actually asking for real-time access to certain kinds of learning data to create these, these early alert systems and plugging into advising systems. Um, some are asking for big data dumps on a regular basis because they have learning scientists who actually want access to the data for research. But regardless, 
we want them to be in some sort of standard format. Um, and I think we all know how dirty data can be when you're pulling it right out of a log file. Um, and so what we want is, so what we're asking for and what's being created actually in these two standards called Caliper and XAPI, and they're sort of warring standards at the moment um, that define learner activity. The idea there is to define it in a standardized way so that if I pull it out of one learning management system and I pull it out of another learning management system, I can actually um, you know, uh, compare the two or do analysis across systems, especially in this environment where faculty are using a multiple array of tools to actually ask students to interact with online. It's not just the LMS anymore. So does that make sense? What librarians get, you know, librarians and data people understand, you know, standards and interoperability and the need to have some sort of standard definitions and metadata. So I want to talk about a few case studies that that um, actually have influenced this work around why, why some of us got so excited, um, and by excited I mean um, frustrated or woke up, um, around uh, uh, learning data as a whole. So um, the first case study is about an LMS vendor, and I hope I took their name out. Um, but anyway, it was an LMS vendor, and, um, and many of you probably know who it is, but it's a software as a service um, LMS vendor, and they were doing a great job of actually talking to us about giving us our data in some sort of format, and um, they were gonna, we were going to use Redshift, and I, we were going to do a bunch of things, and, and it was very exciting, and it seemed wonderful. And all of a sudden, um, a number of institutions that were engaged with them got a bill, and the bill was that they were going to charge us for access to the data. Um, not even just the services on top of it, mind you. Literally just the data dump itself. Uh, and they wanted that as an extra fee. Now we understand if you're providing a, additional services on top of that, that might be something that we want to license. The actual data itself, that sort of, in, it, we felt like, wait a minute, we need to have a conversation with you vendor. Um, and then we went, and of course we looked at the contract, which happened to be an Internet 2 contract, and there was nothing specific about who owned it, access, how it was, you know, other than if we pull out of the deal, you know, here's how, how we're going to, you know, disperse of all of the records and that kind of thing, but it wasn't even that they were going to hand us the data at the end. That wasn't even in the contract. Um, so, we, we actually sort of raised this as an issue, we raised an alarm bell, um, and we're able to get an addendum to that contract because, uh, honestly, because at Educause we pulled a bunch of schools together and said, this kid, you know, we need to go to the vendor and we need to actually talk to them. Luckily they were going IPO, um, <laughs> and, you know, they were going public in like a short period of time, things kind of, um, worked out in our favor that they wanted to, they were very seriously wanted to negotiate. Um, but you can't keep doing this over and over again with every single different vendor. Um, so anyway, without contracts on those free platforms that you see, um, whether they give you the data or not is, is at their whim. And in fact, I think many of these <coughs> vendors feel like they've entered into an agreement with an individual faculty member and individual students that, that the institution actually doesn't have um, a say or role to play in the conversation at all. So um, this is another story, and I am using their name, but I won't use it, in, well, they'll see it anyway. Um, so, so how many of you know what Piazza, have seen Piazza, or, okay. Um, it's, it's, incredibly easy and free um, and so this is their sort of um, this is how they sell this to faculty members it's free it's super simple and it actually is a pretty amazing tool I have to say and it serves a need that isn't currently being served by most learning management systems which is it enables students to ask an anonymous question and then the faculty on the back end can see who asked it, but it, it sort of takes away the embarrassment, perhaps, of asking the stupid question. Um, and it's an incredibly valuable tool. 
But look at 50,000 professors, 1,500 schools, 90 countries. Um, but what's their RevGen model? Does anybody know what Pia how Piazza is even thinking about making money? They're selling the student data <laughs> to employers. So they're actually serving almost like a LinkedIn brokering service. Um, and students, um, it, it gives this little student profile and it says which students, what courses were taken on Piazza. So it almost becomes an, I don't want to call it an unofficial transcript, um, but, it, but it's, a, it's pretty interesting <coughs> the way they're actually um, uh, thinking of generating their revenue. Um, so this was how they used to represent themselves. Does anybody want to tell me what they might, like any warning bells going off, if you're a product <laughs> licensing person, warning bells would be going off. They're like they're using everybody's brand, right? Um, and so again, the leverage that we had with this particular company was to say, uh, you're, you're breaking our licensing, you can't use the cow brand. Um, you know, you're, you're, we're not endorsing this product, this looks like an endorsement of the product. And the one that really killed us was Piazza Careers is what they call their, their LinkedIn service. Uh, I'll call it a LinkedIn service. This is the way the, the old sign-up form used to look for students. So um, I made my daughter log in so I could take screenshots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but here's where it says, where Piazza is an aide in your class. Piazza Careers is an aid in your career. Get discovered by companies instantly. Can you see that the, the button's checked? She didn't check the button. It's opt out, not opt in. Well, who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want to do that? And honestly, here's the thing. I bet they're getting great, you know, I, it, I want our students to get fantastic jobs. I'm not even saying that this is a bad thing, but I think we felt that this was very disingenuous in terms of the way they were doing it because students are not going to uncheck the box and then they can go to the, the vendor, I mean, to the companies and say, we have, you know, 25,000 Berkeley students in our Piazza careers who don't even know that they're in Piazza careers, right? <laughs> so, um, and I'm being, I, and I have to say, I'm, I'm pain, I should not paint them as the villain, but, but it was, we wanted to bring this to their attention. I don't think that they recognized how institutions actually might feel about this, or even how students might feel if they didn't, if they really understood what was happening. Um, so, with some publicity, um, with some phone calls, and with some cease and desist letters, um, we, <laughs> Uh, we were able to make some changes. And, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about the higher education community. This was not just UC Berkeley or even UC. Um, there were a number of us involved in sort of having these conversations together and sort of made it a concerted effort. So now what it says is um, it, nothing's checked and you have a choice. You're either open to hearing from and connecting with companies and alumni or you don't need any help getting the most fulfilling and rewarding um, career <laughs> opportunities. So um, anyway, I, I just have to laugh because I'm like, who is doing their marketing? It's just so um, used car salesman-ish. Like. But um, anyway, but it is better, right? Now they have to check something. They actually kind of have to pay attention. We've got a little more information about Piazza Careers um, other than just the name of it and no link anywhere. So some progress there. Um, this was before where we had faculty endorsements and again, use of the brand. This is now. You can see the names of the schools have been taken off. Um, so, you know, again, I think a little better, but, but we can't be Don Quixote jousting windmills every, with every single vendor every single time. And you have to understand that any of these companies that are not charging you are going to make their money from somewhere, and we all know that it's in the data, right? I mean, you're making money off of the data in some way, shape, or form. You're either selling advertising or, you, you know, even Google and our free Gmail accounts, you know, we, we know, I think, 
I think institutions understood what they were trading off and at least were not getting direct advertisement and that kinds of thing, those kinds of things in, those, um, in, in Google relationships with Google Apps for Ed. But these third party vendors are not, um, not there yet in terms of even thinking about institutional licensing and so um, we need to just be thoughtful about what this means. And the other thing that I would say is, is Piazza has a bunch of great information about our students that if we were running a student success program, <coughs> if we thought that was an ethical good idea, um, to use that data in this way, uh, we're missing out on you know, all of the engineering and, and you know, mainly it's engineering and, and CS where they've really made their inroads. We're missing all of that data then about what our students are doing and how they're interacting with that content. Um, so I wanted to throw a pitch in about libraries and learning data and analytics. And um, a couple of people have been um, in the library world have actually been discussing this for a while. So Stephen Bell um, and uh, Megan Oakleaf are two folks that come to mind. And I think Megan actually did a talk at CNI Fall about um, libraries and learning data. Um, but I think it's interesting because. Um, libraries have a lot of really interesting information about how students are accessing information um, both for their courses and for their research uh, that might be used um, in a variety of ways both for learning research and also perhaps for student success activities um, and so in um, this this ACRL blog came out I should have put the date there it's about 2014 that Stephen Bell actually sort of raised this as a question and said, while academic libraries aren't encountering it yet, it's just a matter of time before higher ed institutions integrate learning analytics at every level of the organization. And he, was, he, he goes through some issues and concerns that he has around that. So that was in 2014. And um, 2016, uh, Megan is actually talking <coughs> a, a lot about the ethics and um, going back to sort of the library's ethical standards around um, protecting privacy and protecting um, the people's ability to do research without question and without intervention. Um, and so she's actually, I think, taking it to the next level and grappling with a lot of those questions uh, right now. So I would encourage you to take a look at, um, at some of the work that she's doing if you want to understand more about how libraries are thinking about it, and it's definitely a spectrum. So this is where it gets long, and this is why I gave you the handout. So um, I just want to check my time. So um, IMS Global. Uh, decided to put together a set, uh, a toolkit around learning data. And this is one piece of the toolkit. And it's an idea that they wanted to throw out some key principles that people should be considering when they're thinking about the use of learning data and learning analytics at their institutions. Um, ownership. IMS actually makes a pretty interesting statement that says that it's the faculty, staff, and students that generate the learning data and it should be theirs. Hold that thought. Um, uh, stewardship, um, pretty basic, you know, we, we should be stewards of the data and we should do it in a, um, a way that has a data governance plan and um, that that we should think about IRB protocols and all of that kind of stuff. I should say what's interesting is a lot of these learning science, big data research up until now, because a lot of it, the data is de-identified, have been uh, often exempt from IRB. I mean, they go to IRB and IRB says, yeah, it's, it's not an issue at all. I think that as, as we start looking more at triangulation and, um, you know, uh, a lot of things. It'll be interesting to see if IRBs continue sort of what I think of as um, maybe not paying as much attention to um, thinking through the ethical decisions around the use of this data. Um, governance, that's pretty standard. Access, um, which is, you know, it, it should be available to the institution. Interoperability, we talked about. Efficacy is interesting, and I want you to think about this. Um, IMS is proposing that um, 
that ethic, I almost think of this as ethics, but, but they're using the term efficacy here to say that learning data should be gathered and utilized for a purpose. That this isn't just about keeping data for data's sake. And that um, it really should be aimed at student success and research and instructional concerns and improving learning science and pedagogy. <coughs> Security and privacy, they lump them together here. And then transparency, which has to do with people should know what you're doing with the data. So I'm going to skip this for a second, and I want to go quickly to the University of California, because we approached it slightly differently um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that we had this framework already in place, um, which was student data privacy principles. Um, and I should say that the focus at the UC level was really vendor focused. I mean, that's, that's sort of what got us excited um, and, and a little anxious. And so that is sort of the lens that we were using as we were writing these. Um, and I think this is my statement now. Um, but this is just my opinion. I think that it may have been a, a slightly limiting lens. On the other hand, if um, you're talking to faculty about collecting their data, it's a lot easier to get things, um, get their, their interest if, if we're attacking the vendors rather than tackling the tougher questions, right? Like, what are we going to do with all the information that we know about faculty, right? Is it going to be used in tenure and promotion? Oh. So, I mean, I, I know it won't be at Berkeley at this moment, but I don't know about other institutions and how they might want to use that information. Um, did you guys just see that tenure is being revoked from some faculty at, um, I'm blanking on the name of the institution, but for not being um, proficient in, in their research and, and scholarship? Oh, Chronicle of Higher Ed just had it. Um, anyway, somebody's actually going to take tenure away from faculty. And I just think it's fascinating. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you start thinking about the information that we could theoretically collect around um, their interaction with students and how frequently they're updating their course. And uh, anyway, it gets interesting. Um, so here are the learning data privacy principles from the University of California. Ownership. Notice how we skirt the issue of ownership. And we just kind of say, faculty and students and the UC retain ownership. Um, and I have to say, I don't think we're very specific about this particular issue. Um, and we don't say the students own their data and the faculty own their data. Um, we don't say it's co-created and that we both have shared ownership. We just sort of leave it out there hanging. Well, then what does data ownership even mean in this context, right? I mean, if I own my data, does that mean I can come to you and say, delete my data today, please? Well, and I had a conversation with that. Exactly. I had a conversation with our registrar where he said, I hope that we're not considering this all the student record. Because if it's part of the student record, students have the right to ask about it and see it. We use the, um, the idea of ethical use instead of efficacy. And quite frankly, I kind of like it better. Um, transparency is the same. We specifically address freedom of expression, protection, and then access and control. And then we talk about practices that we might want to put in place with, um, with ownership, with vendors, and that kind of thing. And I'm not going to go into those. Those are on the second side of your handout. But I want to stop with 15 minutes left. Um, and ask you specifically about the two that we're struggling. When I say we, I mean we as a community who are trying to grapple with this, I think are struggling with the most. One is that ownership question. Um, and, and I'll just say that there are some people that are very um, uh, adamant that the, that the data is st it's student generated and student owned and faculty generated and faculty owned. <coughs> whatever that means. And there are others on the spectrum that talk about co-creation. 
and the fact that this data is co-created in the educational and academic environment, and therefore we have a, um, a, a need to steward it in, in a different way, and that, it, that the institution, for example, if a student owned all their data, theoretically, maybe they could come and tell you that they don't want you to use it for anything, right? Um, in a co-created space where you think of it as co-creation, they probably wouldn't have the ability to say, nope, I want to opt out of everything. I don't want you to use, I don't want you sending me those alerts. I don't, you know, I don't want you sending me that, inform sending that information to the advisor. Um, the institution would say, well, we have an agreement with you that we're going to educate you. And as part of that education process, there are things that we do to ensure your success. Um, and therefore, um, this co-created data, we are going to use it in certain ways. We're going to tell you about it, but you're not going to have the ability to say that you completely own it and therefore could yank it at any time or request that it not be used. Thoughts? No, thank you. Thank you.